Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. We've said a number of times on this show that we're living through a period of war and revolution. Literally, as we sat down to record, we're witnessing the revival of the Syrian civil war. We've had to witness the horrors of the Gaza war for the past year. The war in Ukraine is still raging. And the question of war and revolution is something that the communist tradition has always had to contend with. And we want to highlight today the writings of Lenin on war, which remain to this day the gold standard in terms of our analysis and strategy towards the question. Well-Read Books, the official bookshop of the Revolutionary Communist International, has recently released a collection of Lenin's writings on war. I'll put a link to where you can buy this book in the description for this episode, and it's a real treasure trove. And we're going to talk about how Lenin developed his position on war, how he refined it, and how it was implicated in the Bolsheviks' struggle against capitalism in Russia. But the thing we really want to illustrate here is that what Lenin was writing in the 1900s about the attitude of the hypocritical, two-faced and warmongering representatives of the ruling class and the reformists and the social democracy applies just as much to this day. And to help us deal with this question, we are very happy to have Marie Fredrickson, who is a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist Party in Denmark. Marie, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Joe. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. So, I'd like to set out a bit of a narrative here. Um, the Second International was the mass international organization of the working class of its day on the run-up to the First World War. What was its initial position on the question of war? Uh, first of all, <clears throat> the, the Second International was, um, was an international organization uh, of all the social democratic parties of especially Europe, uh, but of, of the world basically. And you have to imagine, it's not like the social democrats we know today, like Keir Starmer in Britain or Mette Frederiksen in, in Denmark. It was uh, actually, at least on paper, a Marxist revolutionary mass organization. Uh, there were millions of workers who were members. Um, and and they stood uh, on their program and in, in the resolutions, they stood for a Marxist uh, socialist program, uh, fighting for a socialist revolution. And and they were like the only uh, more or less working class parties in in most countries, and had a uh, huge growth in in these years, fighting fighting for the working class. And they met to discuss also on an international level, uh, following Marx, the workers have no home country, uh, saying, uh, what what is our position on, on different uh, issues, and and also on the issue of war that they could see were building up. Uh, in these years, in, in the beginning of the of the twentieth century, that that the war drums were being beaten and and the tensions uh, among the great powers, the great, <laughs> the imperialist powers, were were building up towards uh, leading towards uh, a conflict, uh, some kind of war, uh, and they they discussed it on on several occasions. But uh, I would say the foundation for their position on war was laid in Stuttgart, on the International Congress in Stuttgart in 1907, uh, where, where they discussed it. Uh, and I would say their position is also, is still could serve and still should serve, is the foundation for our position today as, as Marxists um, and as communists fighting fighting for a revolutionary overthrow of, of uh, capitalism. Uh, so I think it's very important to go back to also understand what is the roots of our position today, what is the roots of Lenin's position? He he was a part of, of the Second International at this time and was also a part of, of the Stuttgart uh, conference in, in 1907. Um, so I think this resolution really sets the tone for, for, for all of us today, basically. Uh, and I, I would like to read just uh, a few quotes. Please. Or one quote. Basically. Yeah, please do. Please do. Uh, to say what, what, what did they actually say about about this war that they could see coming. Uh, wars between capitalist states are, as a rule, the outcome of their competition on the world market, for each state seeks not only to secure its existing markets, but also to conquer new ones. In this, the subjugation of foreign peoples and countries plays a prominent role. And they also says, 
uh, the second international, declares once more that the struggle against militarism cannot be separated from the socialist class struggle in general. So what they're basically saying is war is built into capitalism uh, and it is the, the struggle against war is also a struggle for socialist society. Uh, what they also discussed, and I think this is important, is that at this point in history, the nature of capitalism was changing. Capitalism was in its beginning a progressive uh, system, taking the development of the productive forces forward, i.e. That, that humans can produce more and more, that we can live better lives, if it is put to use for the great majority. Um, and, it, and there were progressive wars, for example, uh, wars uh, of national liberation, wars against feudalism, wars against the domination of the church, mm. really reactionary ideas. Uh, there were there were progressive bourgeois wars yeah. that also the socialists were supporting. Just to jump in there, one example yes. that came up on this show a couple of episodes ago is the American Civil War, what we yes. call the Second American Revolution, where the industrial north ultimately conducted an abolitionist war of destruction against the slave-owning South and yes. ultimately carried out, at the time, the greatest act of expropriation in history. Yes. And and that was progressive. Yeah. And Max and Engels supported it. Uh, so it's not like we're against uh, all wars just on principle. I think we will come back to that later. Yes. Uh, but what the Second International discussed at this point in 1907 was that the war they could see coming would be reactionary, that capitalism was entering a reactionary phase, at least in, in Europe, uh, that it an imperialist phase, as Lenin later described it in, in his book, uh, Imperialism, the Highest State of Capitalism. So, so in this war, it it was clear to the leaders of the Second International and to the Congress that th this would be a reactionary war, and that it was up to the uh, social democratic parties, the socialist parties, uh, to try and oppose it. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and also there was when they discussed the resolution, uh, Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg they put forward an amendment that was actually passed at the Congress. Yeah, and I think this is so not funny, but to think of today that this is this is like the the foundation of today's Labour Party and today's Social Democratic Party is this uh, <laughs> this uh, this international where people like Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg were also members mm. and actually passed resolutions that they amendments also they had put forward. Mm -hmm. But what was in these amendments? I think that is also important for for our work today, basically. It says that uh, not only should the social democratic parties, the workers' parties, use the means that they found necessary and possible to oppose the war, but if and when the war broke out, because it was quite obvious it would it would break out, then they should try and utilize the war uh, into a fight and the tensions in the war uh, into a fight against capitalism mm -hmm. to the uh, against uh, for the overthrow of uh, of capitalist society. Yeah, it says to should utilize the crisis created by the war to hasten the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. Right. So that was actually what the Second International decided was their task in the case of the outbreak of a war. So let's just review where we are here. In 1907, an organization with millions of members around the world yes. carrying a huge weight in the working class says to the imperialists, says to the bourgeoisie, if you try to plunge humanity into the horror of a mechanized international imperialist war that will kill yes. millions, yes. then we will use all the powers at our disposal, considerable powers. When you think about the capacity of the working class to yes. carry out general strikes, to strangle production, to halt the war machine... Yes. If you go down this route, we will exploit that crisis in order to yes. not only stop this war, but to overthrow you. That yes. is the line in the sand that the Second International in 1907 is drawing, you know, yes. at the at the behest of Lenin and Luxembourg and others. And because this was a meeting representing a mass organization with big parties and groups all over the world, it carried huge democratic weight as well, right? Yes. You're basically yes. talking about delegates that reflect the attitudes and the opinions and presumably 
recognize the best interests of the entire working class as a global yes. force. When war breaks out, this would carry quite a lot of weight and would be a difficult thing, an impossible thing, a disgraceful thing to simply ignore. But what does happen in 1914 when World War I does break out? What happens is it becomes clear that these resolutions, and it was not only in 1907, it was several other resolutions and congresses later that confirmed this position in 1910 in Copenhagen, for example, uh, that for the leaders of most of the workers' parties of the Second International, they only saw it as uh, words on a paper, like something you say in a, in a nice speech. Mm. Uh, and this is this is the case, and it's also the case today. Uh, I don't remember who said it, but somebody maybe it was Lenin who said, "War and revolution test all political tendencies," mm. because in in times of peace, you can say a lot of nice words, mm. and you can put forward a lot of nice resolutions, and you can sound really radical. But when a war breaks out or a revolution breaks out, you have to you have to um, you have to take sides. You cannot just talk your way through it, you have to choose your side. Uh, and this is was the case in 1914, that even though during the summer of 1914, there were big demonstrations organized by the SPD, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, for example, against the war. But in August, when the war actually broke out, uh, in many countries, uh, the Social Democratic parties, the Second International, they had MPs. And it was put to vote in the different parliaments, uh, whether or not the parliament, also the social democratic MPs, would, would support war credits, that mm -hmm. is funding for the war, mm -hmm. that is basically supporting your own national bourgeoisie in the war, Yeah. Uh, in, in sending workers to slot uh, workers from other countries. Yes. Uh, and all the all those uh, parties, except the Russians and the Serbians uh, and the Serbs in the Second International, they ended up supporting war credits. Yes. Well, the, uh, to, to, to this day, in particular, I would say the war in Ukraine exposed yes. the craven attitude of pretty much all of the so-called worker socialist Yes. organizations, leaderships at the very least, they all lined up behind their respective ruling classes in order to perpetuate a conflict that was clearly yes. against the interests of workers throughout the world, not just those in yeah. the war zone itself, but also those impacted by the economic fallout, by the inflation. Um, the threat of World War Three is something we talked about mm -hmm. a number of times on this show. The leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, also the Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, was the first world leader, actually, to call for Ukraine to be given the green light to use long-range missiles to strike into Russian territory, threatening nuclear war, which I think we can all agree is the worst imaginable outcome from the perspective of the working class. Yes, the Danish Social Democratic Prime Minister has also uh, been very, very aggressive uh, following mm. this line. Yeah. Uh, it's the same as Kirsten. I, I mean, Britain and throughout the EU also leaders voting to increase defence spending yes. at a time when people are struggling to afford their heating yes. bills, afford their grocery shopping. Yes. Austerity is back, but not yes. when it, it applies to the question of arms and financing imperialist adventures abroad. No, no. Denmark is the country who has given the most in support of of uh, to the Ukraine per inhabitant. <laughs> so we're we're just behind you on that one. But I think this is, and it actually goes back to nineteen uh, to nineteen fourteen. This question of whether you support you ha you have to you have to take sides, and the leaders of the social democratic parties in almost all of Europe mm -hmm. ended up siding with their own national bourgeoisie i.e. defending capitalism mm. against the working class, mm. against the working class of other countries, but also against the working class of their own country, basically, mm -hmm. uh, saying we will support our own national bourgeoisie uh, in defense of the fatherland, is what they said. That was their excuse. Uh, and and this uh, this line we have seen, they have chosen from back then, but, but it's, it's the same line they're following today and has actually sealed, I would say, the faith of the Social Democratic Party and the Second International 
all the way back from, uh, from 1914 and led to the split in the whole workers' movement between those who chose their own national bourgeoisies and those who chose the working class and, and a revolutionary solution, basically. Mm -hmm. And actually, those who chose to stand on the foundation of the Second International and the resolutions that were voted on uh, before the war broke out. We'll come back to the question of those who took the principled internationalist line in a moment, yes. but the one fig leaf that you mentioned about defense of the fatherland, that's that's true, that, that's, that's one dimension, but mm. the ruling class will always find some sort of democratic cover as well yes. for its imperialist adventures. And particularly the question of small nations' right to self-determination. So yes. in the context of World War I, it was poor little Belgium on one side mm. and poor little Serbia on the other, which yes. each belligerent imperialist bloc blamed the other for threatening. Yes. We should be clear, the Serbian communists, as I understand it, took a principal position on this question. They said, do not use our country's self-determination mm. which in fairness we should say was actually threatened by austria there was actually a genuine claim there do not use the self-determination of our country as an excuse for plunging the working class as a whole into the yes. horror of war this is against the interest of the working class as a whole yes. which was a very courageous and correct position to take i yes. wanted to pull out a quote of my own actually um from lenin talking about the way in which the ruling class uses these democratic fig leaves. The most widespread deception of the people as perpetrated by the bourgeoisie in the present war is the concealment of its predatory aims with the national liberation ideology. The English promised the liberation of Belgium, the Germans of Poland, etc. Mm. Actually, as we have seen, this is a war waged by the oppressors of the majority of the nations of the world for the purpose of fortifying and expanding such oppression. And I think that in the context of Ukraine, and Gaza, this is so prescient and so relevant yes. because all of the so-called left, all of the reformists, mm. I'm particularly thinking of a figure in my country, Paul Mason, a so-called mm. Marxist journalist, he used to be an economist on the BBC and Channel 4, who's become one of the most full-throated supporters of British imperialism, one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the Ukraine war. And he's mm. always talking about this question of Ukraine's right to self-determination. Yes. But first of all, Ukraine is being used as a staging ground by NATO for yes. ultimately an American conflict against Russia, and it's been destroyed as a consequence. Mm. And moreover, who's actually waging this war? on mm. the side that Mason supports, this right-wing social democrat, mm. it's American imperialism that's yeah. chiefly financing and facilitating and coordinating this war. The most reactionary force on earth as the most powerful imperialist yes. nation. And when it comes to the ruling class's support for the slaughter that Israel is conducting mm. against um, the Palestinians in Gaza mm. and the West Bank, and also subsequently in Lebanon, Mm. They always cite Israel's right to self-defense. They mm. talk about the Jewish right to self-determination, even mm. as Israel violates the self-determination of another country by invading yes. Lebanon and bombing many others, including Syria. Yes. So the ruling class has always used this trick. And the right-wing yes. social Demo democrats have always given a left cover to this trick yes. in order to support their ultimate goal, which is to perpetuate their control over yes. markets and spheres of influence. Yes, and I think this is the, also, if we go back to what is like a basic Marxist position on the war, and Lenin says it very clearly, that you have to look behind what what is the excuse of the war, because mm -hmm. they will also f always find an excuse, defense of the fatherland, the right of nations to self-determination, yeah. uh, democracy, uh, human rights, we have to fight for women in Afghanistan. I, they will always find an excuse, <laughs> but you cannot look at the excuse, and they will use a lot of propaganda, like we have seen with today, the last few years. I have never yeah. seen so much propaganda as, as the last yeah. few years. If Eurovision existed in 1914, probably Belgium would have won. <laughs> yes, uh, but but the thing is, you have to look behind. Uh, what what interests have these nations been following in the years leading up to the war? And I think it's so fun, funny, but they say like the First World War, this is what we learn in history books. It was uh, started by the assassination of the Archduke. Uh, but 
if it was started there, and that was like the reason for the war, how come the Second International in 1907, seven years before it broke out, could say a war is coming, and this is what the war is about. Yeah. <laughs> it's about imperialist interest, uh, and it will be a reactionary war. So what Lenin says is, when you look at a war, you have to look behind the smokescreen and the propaganda and all the excuses and look at what are the class interests behind this war. Uh, and he said this imperialist war in 1914, but I think it's very applicable to Ukraine too. He he described it as a war between two um, slave owners, <laughs> one having 100 slaves and one having 200 slaves, uh, fighting for a more just <laughs> redistribution of the slaves. Mm-hmm. So he said, "What? What is this? Is an imperialist war? What is and what is that? Uh, and I think this is this is also a crucial question for understanding wars today and also the the First World War. Uh, saying this is an imperialist war, and that uh, and both sides in this is imperialist, and they use these small nations like the Serbs or or Belgium as an excuse mm-hmm. for for uh, fulfilling or following their own imperialist interests." Mm-hmm. Uh, fighting another great imperialist power. Mm -hmm. So what he basically said was, this is a fight for a distribution and a redistribution among imperialist powers in Europe of colonies, markets, uh, spheres of influence and so on, to follow their own interests. Uh, uh, And of course, what is the basis of capitalism? It's competition. So if, if someone gains someone else has to lose. Right. So if Germany wants more markets and colonies and the world is already divided, they have to take it from someone. Mm-hmm. So what ensues? A war ensues. Yes. And then you find an excuse. Some nation, somebody got killed. Some nation got invaded by another country as an excuse. And then you have an excuse to, to start the war. Um, but, but you have to look behind what they actually say the war is about. Yeah, but it's an infantile way of justifying any sort of conflict it's like a schoolyard excuse like who threw the first punch yes. but, but but also they have to because <laughs> how do you how do you make the <laughs> millions of people go into war to get slaughtered their sons to get slaughtered for profits <laughs> you, you, you cannot convince anybody about that uh, you can convince them uh, to do it for honor or we fight russian reaction or we fight german reaction or we fight whatever reaction that is not in our own country you fight for democracy you fight for these values then you can at least in the beginning uh, you see this hysteria being built up uh, you have to give the people the, the great majority is something to fight for, and yeah. that will not be the profits of the capitalist. <laughs> so, so they need an excuse. Uh, otherwise, they can launch a war costing millions and millions of pounds or, or whatever country currency you're using, euros, uh, and and basically getting, getting a whole generation killed. Yeah, costing millions in terms of the financial burden, but also yes. costing millions of lives. Yes. I just want to take one more swipe at yes. the, the liberals and the reformists who were always, as you say, tested to destruction, exposed by war, because the same people who will be anti-war during peacetime become the most aggressive yes. warmongers yes. when the fighting actually begins. And this was yes. true of the Second International yes. and some of its leading figures, the likes of Karl Kautsky, for example, who was probably the most famous and important leader of the world socialist movement up to that point, he ultimately, when it came down to it, threw in behind German imperialism. Yeah, and then they found an excuse, like Kautsky, like, we have to fight Russian reaction. Well, and Lenin was, well, let let the Russians fight Russian reaction. (laughs) Yeah. What you're doing when you support the the German war is actually supporting a, a German imperialism, but also strengthening the Tsar in Russia. You're not helping the yeah. fight of the Russian workers against Tsarism. You're actually helping reaction in Russia when because they can and and it's the same today because they can like gather support in the beginning at least behind a uh, fighting German reaction. Um, so so no thank you for the help. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is a question yeah. for the for the Russian workers it, it itself. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, in order to combat Tsarist autocracy, we're simply going to have to kill millions of your countrymen. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs>
So you mentioned that there were people in the Second International who took a principled stand against the war from a proletarian point of view. We should quickly say it is possible to oppose a war from a bourgeois point of view. It's also possible to take um, a a peacenik pacifist position, for example, that doesn't have any proletarian content. We'll maybe come back to that later on. But let's talk about the Zimmervolls. Um, so the Zimmerwald conference was a meeting of the anti-imperialist, anti-war left. Can we talk about this anti-war revolutionary bloc and about the Zimmerwald conference? This sometimes it can feel hard to be a revolutionary, but you have to remember, in nineteen four at this time, nineteen fifteen. It was hard to be a revolutionary. Yeah. You had the Second International, millions of people, the leadership completely uh, betrayed. The International shattered a war, really reactionary war going on. A lot of the leaders, either in exile or in prison, uh, the leaders of the of the German left, like Rosa Luxemburg, were put in prison um, for her own defense. Uh, and those who met in Simmerwald, those who opposed the war, uh, there is this uh, famous quote by Lenin uh, or joke that they could all fit in a few stagecoaches. This was the situation of anti-war, and they were not even on the same page. There were several uh, trends uh, at the Simo Congress, uh, actually three main trends. They only met 38 people. <laughs> yeah. We should also say, you know, objectively speaking, the masses at the, at the outbreak of World War I generally supported their national war efforts. Not only yes. were the Zimmervolds left isolated in the movement, they were isolated in society, the working class as a whole, because in large part of the betrayal of their leaders, they bought the idea that this was about defense of the fatherland, yes. it'd be a quick little war, it'd be over before Christmas, yes, exactly. um, and willingly marched to their deaths. Yes. Yes, and and what else to do when the leaders you have trusted for several decades suddenly go and say, but this is this is uh, in your best interest. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not the workers' fault. And this is a point that we've had to make yes. a number of times over the last period because it's always yes. inevitably the the beaten down old uh, sectarian left who will say, oh, the yes. workers are stupid, or the workers are belligerent, the workers yes. support their queen and country or king and country, yes. they rally around the flag. No, the leaders of the left betray and bamboozle yes. the working class. That's yes. the reason that they can be temporarily pulled behind reaction. Yes. Yes. So, and this is was the background of the similar meeting, and it must have felt a bit bleak. But what they did, and this is what similar also represents, I think, is the beginning of a light at the end of the tunnel. Actually gathering a internationalists, I would say, uh, from different countries to oppose the war. That was like the beginning of what was later revolutionary upsurge a few years later uh, Mm. in all of Europe. We know also with the the Russian Revolution and which was what actually ended the the First World War. But these 38 people who met in in Simmerwald in in Switzerland, they they met and discussed. uh, And there were these uh, three trends. They were like uh, the right wing, uh, who were uh, right wing, but yeah, the relatively pacifists. speaking, relatively yeah. speaking, yes, in, in this gathering, uh, those who who were for peace, but but who wouldn't break with the old international, with the second international, who who just said it was a question of like reviving it. Mm. Uh, then there was the left wing, which was uh, represented by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, especially, uh, and they they were they said this is an imperialist war. Uh, we have to break with the old Second International. It's dead mm. because we have to have a clear banner. Mm. And what we have to do is to oppose, not only oppose the war, like in general terms of peace, but to turn this war into a civil war right. against our own bourgeoisie. Which really was just um, an elaboration of the position taken in Stuttgart in 1907. Exactly. Yeah. That's what that's what that resolution, which was democratically decided by exactly. all and sundry at that meeting, meant. We will yes. use all means necessary in order yes. to stop this. Exactly. Uh, and, and to utilize uh, the crisis, and, and I think this is the main point, mm. not just to stop the war, but to utilize the crisis of the war uh, into a fight against our own bourgeoisie. Right. Because that is also the only way we can end wars. 
mm. because we might have a peace. But I think Lenin, he says, an imperialist, uh, a peace following an imperialist war, if it's not uh, peace uh, by a socialist revolution, will just be an imperialist peace leading to new imperialist wars. Yes. So if you want to stop wars, you cannot just say peace in general. You have to. The only way you can stop an imperialist war is actually by a socialist revolution. I'd like to just pause on this point for a little bit because I think it's something that people often have misconceptions about. Because it's not as though Marxists and communists are opposed to ceasefires, to peace, to temporary mm. breaks in fighting. Exactly. If, for example, a ceasefire was to be agreed in Gaza tomorrow, of course yes. we would yes. support that because anything that could even put a break on this nightmare, yes. even for a short time, of course yes. we would support. But the point is, nothing that gave rise to that conflict in the first place will have been resolved. So all no. you're doing is setting up for the next outbreak of the fighting, which indeed was what happened with yes. the 7th of October 2023. There exactly. had been a ceasefire. Obviously, Israel hadn't stopped um, brutalizing yes. and killing the Palestinians. You know, there was a horrible bombing campaign in 2021 uh, following an attempted peaceful march of return. Yes. Um, the, the, the oppression and annexation of the West Bank was continuing. Mm. All of these things still existed. All these protests were still underway. There was a flashpoint and the fighting escalated. Yes. We wouldn't oppose a ceasefire, but unless there was a revolutionary solution, then yes. you're going to have another upswing yes. in the fighting. This is the thing, right? Wars can end with the exhaustion and destruction of one side. They yes. can end. They usually do end in negotiation. Yes. But unless they're ended by the revolutionary overthrow of the belligerent parties, then all that's going to happen mm. is you have a break in the fighting and prepare yes. for the next outbreak of fighting. Yeah, because you don't remove the roots mm. of the war. Yes. And I would say also, we fight for a world without wars. Yes. <laughs> but we don't think that that is possible without fighting. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so we do. F we are against war, <laughs> but it's completely uh, naive to think, to just say that, because war is, as they said in the Stuttgart revolution, resolution, wars are implicit in capitalism. Mm -hmm. And as long as capitalism exists, there will be wars. Yes. So unless we fight for a revolutionary overthrow of this society, you will at best have these temporary uh, imperialist pieces, breaks. Yes. And in Gaza, for example, it won't be a return just to the brutal situation existing before the 7th of October, which was decades of brutal repression. Mm -hmm. It will be that on top of all the destruction and death being put upon the Palestinians for the last more than a year. That's right. So it's not even uh, going back to a status quo before that mm -hmm. was not good, that led to the current situation. Mm. It will be even w worse. So so what we say, yes, of course, <laughs> we don't want people to get bombed as they do in Gaza. We would like it to stop, but it will not solve anything. Yes. And this is what distinguishes us from the bourgeois yes. and liberal pacifists yes, exactly. who just reject fighting, reject conflict and war yes. in principle, in general. Yes. The fact is, war is a reality of the yes. system that we have, where yes. you have a tiny minority who compete to control all of the resources that humanity could yes. use to better our lives. Yes, War is a product of capitalism, yes. and war is about killing people. If yes. we want to put a stop to capitalism, then we have to fight it. We have to bring yes. it down. And that's the yes. only way to put a stop to war in general, not just this or that war. Yes, exactly. And I think this is also one of the brilliant parts of, of Lenin's position, because there's a lot of people on, also on the left wing who can say something is um, imperialist. And they see imperialism like a, a policy of annexations or a, a aggressive going to war. And, and also that is how Kautsky put it forward. But what Lenin says, imperialism is just... It, it's not just a question of one government pursuing an imperialist policy. Imperialism is a stage of capitalism mm. where the world is divided be between imperialist powers and they will fight for the domination. And when one side uh, gains strength and another side recedes, there will be a test of strength. 
Mm. And that is wars. So it is it is a permanent stage of capitalism where wars are implicit and, and huge wars are implicit because we have this div division of the world. So it's not just a question of having one government pursuing an imperialist policy or Putin becoming mad with imperialist, uh, which is what they say about Russia today. Yeah. It's a question of the stage of imperialism. And therefore, if we want to end reactionary imperialist wars, we have to end imperialism. That mm. means ending capitalism. And I think this is the what what defined also the Zimmerwald left and Lenin and the Bolsheviks was really continuing to stress this point. Mm -hmm. There can be no fight against this war, against it is turned into a fight for socialist revolution. Yeah. What's really brilliant about Lenin's position on war is that it's just an elaboration of the defining principle of Bolshevism, which is the insistence on the independence of the working class on yes. all things. Yes. It's that applied to the question of war. In the same yes. way that in the political struggle, Lenin said, you do not ally with the liberals, you do yes. not ally with the so-called democratic bourgeois, yes. even if you're fighting for democratic demands, even if you're fighting for a parliament, a constitution, yes. whatever, you don't ally with the class enemy. You pursue those demands through working class methods and working class organizations. It's the same yes. principle, but applied to yes. conflict. The working yes. class as a class struggles against the warmongering imperialists Yes. Separately from the bourgeois peaceniks, yes. because you're fighting for the overthrow of the system that produces yes. war in the first place. Yes. Um, I want to talk about another one of Lenin's positions, which is mm. used as a bit of a stick to beat him with. Um, the question of revolutionary defeatism. It's probably the position that is most widely associated with Lenin and his attitude yes. to war, which I think is a little bit of a misnomer. It's a bit of an oversimplification of Lenin's contributions on this question, to say the least. But what actually is revolutionary defeatism and what was Lenin actually arguing? Yes, what he actually says, and I want to I want to read a quote just to make sure. Yeah. Uh, I want to read the last part first. And the first part last. The last will be first, the first shall be last. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I think that's the first time we've had a Bible quote on this uh, <laughs> on this show. He says, uh, but to use Russian social democrats, but to us Russian social democrats, there cannot be the slightest doubt that from the standpoint of the working class and of the toiling masses of all the nations of Russia, the defeat of the Tsarist monarchy, the most reactionary and barbarous of governments, which is oppressing the largest number of nations and the greatest mass of the population of Europe and Asia would be the lesser evil. The first part of that quote is, in the present situation, it is impossible to determine from the standpoint of the international proletariat, the defeat of which of the two groups of belligerent nations would be the lesser evil for socialism. Mm -hmm. What he's basically saying is all the leaders of the social democratic parties, they ended up defending their own national bourgeoisies, saying we, we should have uh, Burgfried, I don't know how to say, it. we should have civil peace, we should not yeah. have class struggle, because that could lead to the defeat of our of our nation in this war. And Lenin, he said, no, we should pursue class struggle <laughs> and we should pursue it against our own ruling class. Uh, even if it means the defeat of our own bourgeoisie, yes. because that is the only way to end the war. Yes. So the defeat of our own bourgeoisie is the lesser evil. Mm -hmm. It's against this idea of, of civil peace, of, of stopping class struggle yeah. during the war and, and just uh, take it up again after the war. Yeah, it's against this truce between the, the classes. opposed classes. The, yes. it, it, it's against this idea that the Social Democrats held up, which is, look, this is a national <laughs> crisis. We'll get back yes. to striking for exactly. better paying conditions and whatever yes. after the war. But for now, we yes. have to just buckle down and yes. we all rally under the same flag. That's what Lenin was opposing. And that is why... You should read Lenin, but you should also read the context, <laughs> because yeah. sometimes I have seen people who, who read it and doesn't understand the context things yeah. are set in. You should also always understand with Lenin, who is he arguing against? Yes. And 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 therefore, the, the question was, the Second International had broken down. Mm -hmm. The leaders had completely betrayed. They all mm -hmm. supported their own national bourgeoisie. And he said... Basically, the same thing that Liebknecht said in Germany, our aim 
main enemy is at home. We should not uh, we should not accept this excuse of defense of the fatherland. Yes. We should fight our own national bourgeoisies and in order to fight this war. So it is in this context, he's talking to educate the cadres and he's talking against this a stream of social uh, opportunism, social chauvinism that is uh, being spread around the entire international and has destroyed the international. So right. it is in order to combat this main trend in in the in the labor movement in the left wing that that this is what he focuses on. Yes, that's right. Uh, the way that it's presented by people who attack Lenin is that he was a traitor who said that when a war begins, you should do everything you can in order to defeat your own yes. um, country, to ensure the defeat of your own country, because that's the lesser evil in terms of the outcome. Yes. Whereas what Lenin's saying is a lot more nuanced than that. And is and he, no- and he, and he actually says uh, quite uh, clear that... Uh, this is does not mean acts of sabotage, <laughs> right, <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, and this actually does mean, and I think this is also important because he says many times this question of civil war and what does it mean. And I think for many people also on the left who hear this word today, you think of uh, Wanda or something like that. This mm. is what he means by civil war. We should just start that in our own country. But what what does he says? He says. Uh, the conversion of the imperialist war into civil war cannot be made any more than a revolution can be made. It develops out of a number of diverse phenomena. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we should do as as revolutionaries is prepare by ag- agitation. Yes. By putting forward revolutionary demands, the demands of the masses, by not voting for war credits. This is what he means by preparing. Yes. Um, this is what he means by a defeat of, of our own uh, bourgeoisie is, is a lesser evil. He mm-hmm. means the the working class of the different countries should pursue their own interests um, independently of whether that is the interest of the national bourgeoisie. Sure. And, and against me- them. And this misrepresentation of that in the position, it was used in his day to slander him as a German agent by yes. the Tsarist authorities, claiming that he was working directly on behest of the yes. German government, the German Kaiser, in order to sabotage the Russian war effort. I mean, our answer to that is, what was Lenin's position on the German revolution, which <laughs> broke out in 1918 and actually put a stop to Germany's participation in the First World War? We should be clear, the First World War, and if you haven't read it already, I recommend that you pick up a copy of Alan Woods' book, World War I, The Great Slaughter, yes. which goes into detail about the causes for the events of and the end of and the yes. aftermath of the yes. First World War. Um, the First World War was ended by a revolution, by a working yes. class revolution triggered by um, a mutiny in Kiel by revolutionary sailors. It brought down the Kaiser. Yes. And it resulted in a mass revolution which almost overthrew German capitalism altogether, was only saved, German capitalism was only rescued by the social democracy. Yes. Who allied with the far-right Freikorps in order to crush the Spartacist uprising, to crush the communists in Berlin, Mm. murdering Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, amongst others, rescued German capitalism from the working class. So yes. what was Lenin's position on the German Revolution? It was full-throated support. He yes. recognized that as the most important development, yes. actually. More important than the Russian Revolution. Exactly. He said he was ready to uh, uh, to sacrifice the Russian Revolution if that could bring about the victory of the German Revolution. Yes. Because that was the, the main point. Because, because German capitalism was much more developed uh, and the German working class was much stronger than the Russian uh, and that is also what the Bolsheviks said and Lenin said when the Russian Revolution broke out was we, we have to have we just have to hold on until the world uh, revolution comes to our help, especially uh, the German Revolution. Mm-hmm. So that was like the the perspective for the Russian Revolution was to wait for the German Revolution to come and to come and help them. Yes. And they did everything they could to support the German workers in their fight against the, the German uh, Kaiser and, and German capitalism. So really, we could say that Lenin, if he was a German agent, he was a pretty lousy one. Yes. <laughs> if, if, if I'd been the Kaiser, I'd have asked for my gold yes. back yes. Uh, if he really was a German agent. Yes. But anyway, putting that, that nonsense aside, the other way we can demonstrate 
Lenin's real attitude was also on his tactical flexibility, because it's not true that he took the same public position on the question of war, exactly the same rhetoric at every mm. given moment, no. because he had to contend with what he described as the honest defensism yes. of the Russian workers. Yeah. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yes. First, I, I think it's really important that it doesn't sound like he had an, a, a position for the cadres and then another position uh, that was public. He had right. the same position. It's a question of how you frame it. Mm. Uh, so what he realized when he came back to Russia in April 1917, um, in February 1917, the Tsar had been overthrown by a revolution, um, not a socialist revolution. Uh, the October Revolution uh, came in October, obviously. Uh, but the Tsar has, has fallen in February, uh, and Lenin and other revolutionaries were able to come back. And Lenin came back to Russia in 1970, in April 1917. And what he realized what was that among a huge layer of the popul the majority of the population, there was a yearning for peace, which you can understand. Millions of young men being slaughtered and, and uh, maimed in horrible conditions. That what started the the February Revolution were the women workers of Petrograd demanding peace and bread because they could not live. They they were starving. Their kids were starving. So there was a real yearning for peace, which is quite obvious. I think when the first propaganda in every war uh, starts to come down, it becomes clear what is what is war, imperialist war for the working class. That it's just them being uh, sacrificed for the interest of the capitalist. And that was becoming obvious. So there was this yearning for peace among the great population. So so what Lenin understood was this was not a peace in an imperialist sense, in a reactionary sense, like the capitalists, they wanted peace in, uh, or they wanted to defend the fatherland in order to, to defend their own interests, to have annexations, colonies, and so on. But those in Russia who, who were defensists, uh, who, who didn't want just a, a, a defeat of Russia in the war. That was that was an honest um, feeling. It, it was not reactionary. It was progressive. And to use that feeling and explain and connect it to the revolutionary position, which was, if we want to defend ourselves, basically, our homes, our lives, if we want to have peace, that can only come through ourselves, the working class and the toiling masses taking power. Mm. And I think that is the basic task of revolutionaries. It is to take our analysis and understanding of the situation and then figure out how do we connect this with the feeling, the sensations, the consciousness uh, that the masses have. Yes. And take out what is progressive from that and connect it with the need to overthrow this society. Yes. And, and that is basically what, what Lenin did, I would say. And the last thing I want to talk about mm -hmm. is what Lenin's position was in power, because I already said that the German war effort was halted by the German Revolution, and yes. the Russian participation in the war was ended by the Russian Revolution, mm. because one of the Bolsheviks' main demands, main slogans, was for an immediate end to the war. Obviously, there was some to and fro subsequently about exactly what position they were going to take. There were some leading Bolsheviks who wanted to, as they put it, turn the imperialist war into a revolutionary war. We won't get into that. Breast the Tovsk's mm -hmm. negotiations, it's all very complicated, mm -hmm. extremely interesting. I yes. think we might do an episode on the Civil War and Bresk Litovsk uh, in season four. Mm -hmm. But just for now, what do Lenin and the Bolsheviks, um, having pulled Russia out of World War One, what do they do in relation to the question of war? Yes, so I want to say, I think this is also really important. It's something that we need to remember today, that war and revolutions, they come out of the same tensions. Yes. Uh, and therefore, war is very often ended by revolutionary movements. Mm. Whether those succeed in actually overthrowing capitalism is another thing. But war, because it can seem so bleak and that propaganda fills everything in the in the outbreak of war, but then the masses realize what, what is actually a war for them, because it's not the rich that are being slaughtered. It's not their money that is being spent on uh, armaments. It is, it is the welfare. It is the wages of the workers. Those are those who are being sacrificed. So war 
very often leads to revolutionary situations. And in a very short period of time, like we spoke about Simavald in 1915, the Russian Revolution in 1917, it's two years. Yes. It's a very short amount of time that what seemed very bleak turned into a revolutionary situation. Mm -hmm. I think that is important uh, to remember. And it only did that because Lenin and the Bolsheviks kept uh, didn't fall into this propaganda and follow the propaganda, but but kept a very sharp line on understanding the war and, and putting their position forward. That is why they could win the masses in October 1917 and explain. They had this, this slogan, the Bolsheviks, of peace, land, and bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and explaining, because these are not necessarily communist slogans, but explaining that these demands can only be fulfilled if the workers take power. Yeah, actually an elaboration of the permanent revolution. Yes, exactly. Which was the subject of last week's episode. Ah, and okay. yes. A good yes, demonstration exactly. of what we were saying at the time, that Lenin, in essence, adopted Trotsky's position. Exactly. Because that's exactly what Trotsky was arguing for, the democratic demands in yes. this period, especially in a backward country like Russia, could only yes. be accomplished by yes. the working class. And having done that, having, yes. having achieved those demands, the working yes. class would immediately carry on to begin its own tasks and yes. socialist reconstruction. But also because it became clear after February, the bourgeoisie of Russia were not going to end the war. No. They were going to continue it for their interest. Yes. For because, their imperialist interest. Well, that's right. I mean, in February, the Tsar was overthrown. The autocracy yes. was brought down. But Kerensky, who we should yes. say was nominally a socialist. He was nominally yes. a member of the social democracy from its right wing, but nonetheless, he was going to continue the war on behalf of, ultimately, on behalf of Russian capitalism. Yes. So so, so what they actually did was to take this, this demand of peace and bread and land and say, if we want to achieve this, we all power to the Soviets. The mm. workers' councils, uh, the soldiers' councils, uh, the Soviets should take power themselves. Mm -hmm. And what we will do, uh, if that happens, and it happened in, in October 1917, we will send out an immediate call for peace without annexations. And what we will also do, and that is also something they stressed in the period from February to October, we will make all the secret the treaties public. Yeah. <laughs> and I think some imperialist <laughs> bourgeoisies around the world were a bit uh, shaking by that. Yeah. Because th this is what happens. It, behind all the allies and all the talk about uh, the right of nations uh, to self-determination and so on, what they had actually done was carve up the world among them uh, in order to ally with each other. If you go with us in the war, you will get this part of this country to yes. dominate and exploit. Uh, and what the Bolsheviks did was to make it all open. Well, for example, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was the yeah. 1916 treaty agreed between Britain and France with assent from Tsarist Russia and Italy that agreed upon their carving up of the Ottoman Empire. Yes. And Sykes-Picot has huge implications in terms of the development of politics in the 20th century, the barbarism that engulfed the Middle East. Yes. The Bolsheviks made that public. I think that's an incredible demand. I think that that deserves more attention, actually. Yes. I mean, it's something that socialist, communist, revolutionaries should make more a part of mm. their programs, of yes. exposing all the rotten shenanigans conducted behind the scenes by their ruling classes yes. with the ruling classes of the nations. Yes. It is clear it's quite uh, uh, easier to do that once you have taken power and ac actually have access mm. to all the secret treaties <laughs> that, mm. they have, uh, that they have made because there is a reason why they keep them secret now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is that they don't want the, the public to know about all their deals uh, 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 and how they, they are carving up the world. Uh, but this is what the Bolsheviks did and also what they did when they started uh, peace negotiations with Germany at Preslitovsk. They, they made it all public. Yes. To say also, we we have nothing to hide. Yes. Quite the opposite, and we appeal to the workers of the world to help us in these peace negotiations. Yes. Because we, the workers of Russia, we have no interest in continuing this war, and we have no interest in oppressing any nation mm -hmm. or any peoples 
It is up to them. That was actually the way of of securing the right of nations to self determination. Yes, was the workers taking power in the oppressor nation? Yeah, and um, something I want to draw attention to in the most mm. recent issue of the Independence of Marxism magazine, there's an article about the revolutionary movement that broke out in Austria concurrently with the negotiations mm. of Brest Litovsk, partly inspired by the fact that the Russians were making the brutal concessions, the punishment actually, that the imperialists were inflicting as a price for peace, mm. public. Um, you know, they were really trying to set up mm. the destruction of the new workers' regime and inspired indignation and huge sympathy from millions yes. of workers in the belligerent nations. Again, I think that we need to do a full episode about the civil war, about Brest yeah. Tovsk, because um, there's, there are so many lessons and it's such an interesting story. But I just want to bring this discussion to a close, which has also been extremely interesting. I wonder if you could summarize on the basis of what we've been talking about in a sort of sentence or two, what is the real essence, the real core of Lenin's position on war? I would say it is to always uh, keep an independent class position, look behind the interests of the bourgeoisie and never trust uh, the excuses for war. And in order to end war, and in order to end, uh, you, you have to end imperialism, you have to end capitalism. You have to utilize the cr crisis of capitalism that is leading to war in order to overthrow the system and to end war once and for all. Well, thank you so much, Marie. And I hope that this has been as interesting for our viewers and listeners as it has been for me. I think that the parallels with today that emerge from this discussion are so stark. And I think that it's so clear that it was Lenin's incredible grasp of Marxism that allowed him to develop a position on war that stands up to the subsequent hundred years of history. And yes. if you want to go into more depth about Lenin's writings on the question, then once again, I recommend well-read books, collected writings of Lenin, volume one, Lenin on Imperialist War. It's quite a chunky volume, as you can see, but believe me, this is an absolute goldmine and you'll learn a huge amount. And I think that it's unfortunate that we have to acknowledge that war is going to be the defining factor in world politics going into 2025, um, as it's emerged as the key factor in perspectives in 2024. And as a consequence, it's all the more important that communists have a very, very clear position on the question of war, how we respond to it, how we organize to fight the warmongering policies of our own imperialists, and that we recognize that ultimately, as Marie said, as Lenin argues, it's only through our own forces and only by the overthrow of the capitalist system which is the source of war in the first place, that not just this or that war, but all war can be consigned to the dustbin of history. Um, just before I say goodbye to Marie, I want to say that this is our penultimate episode of the year. Next week's episode will be a bit of a roundup of 2024. We're hoping to keep it under an hour and a half because a lot has gone on, but that will be our season finale. But don't worry, we'll be back in the new year with a new suite of episodes with different topics, different speakers, different formats. I hope you've enjoyed the season thus far. One more episode to go. For now, Marie, thank you so much for joining us from Denmark. Thank you, Joe. And I will see you all next week for our final episode of the year. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.